Gather around, children, and I'll tell you the story of the time that I wrote the Windows Start menu, or parts thereof. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, retired software engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today I'm going to tell you the time that I wrote the Windows Start menu. But to be clear, a lot of people wrote the Windows Start menu because it's actually just a Windows menu, so everybody who worked on the user 32 side of the menuing can take some credit. And of course, the Windows 95 team that designed the Start menu in the first place should take the lion's share of the credit. Now, I wrote the stuff that paints the stuff that you actually see in the beginning and that actually runs the program that you run at the end, and so I figured those two bookends make a nice way to tell the story from start to finish as to what goes on. I'll tell you exactly what I wrote or the interesting parts of what I wrote and what the start menu does. First, a brief word from our sponsor, 15 seconds from me. I wrote a book this year. It's called The Non-Visible Part of the Autism Spectrum, and it's intended for folks that don't have autism but who might share characteristics with people on the spectrum. It's how to best manage those characteristics of being on the spectrum and live your best life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known long ago. You can check out a free sample of the book on Amazon using the link in the video description. Thank you. Now back to the start menu. Now, of course, Windows 95 already had a start menu and it worked well enough. At least it did for Windows 95. The problem was that it said Windows 95. And so we couldn't just change it to Windows NT because that was not going to be the name of the product long term. It was Windows NT4 Professional or Windows NT4 Workstation or Advanced Server or Server or depending on what product SKU you have. And so we needed to put that in the start menu. And if we had that for all the different languages that Windows NT supported, that would be a huge matrix of these bitmaps that we would have to create in advance and hopefully dynamically load on the fly when you went to render the start menu and not take up memory and cache it or whatever, but let's not design it today. Let's just settle down and talk about it. So to avoid having a bunch of bitmaps, I wanted to render it live using GDI calls. What I wound up doing was to paint the blue-black gradient that you see on the box, and I don't know whose idea that was, whether it was my idea, whether it was some product designer's idea, or whether it was just natural because that's what the box looks like. Either way, that was our logo, so that's what we wound up painting as the start menu. You get a black-blue fade from top to bottom, and everything above the top of the black fade is just rendered full black. To draw that, I actually just use a simple GDI call and fill it with that gradient that I define and pass off to GDI, and it'll even do dithering if you don't have that many colors available in your system. Rendering the text was the hard part because you can't, and at least you couldn't at that time, draw sideways text. You certainly couldn't on Windows 95, but could you do it on Windows NT? Well, not directly, but Windows NT provided something called coordinate transformations that allowed you to do things like rotate the entire device context. If you did that by 90 degrees and gave it the right coordinate transformations, then you could magically draw into it and it would render it directly up. So that's what I wound up doing was to just render it normal and then let the device transformation do the rotation for me and it renders quite nicely. So to render it, it's just the fat font for the word Windows or Windows 2000 or Windows NT or whatever it is in that version and then a skinny version for professional or workstation or whatever you're running. Now, speaking of the Win95 version, one limitation they had is they were running primarily on a NetBuoy protocol stack for their networking because TCP IP was kind of a late addition to the Windows 95 product. So internally, I think they were primarily self-hosted on NetBuoy. One thing about NetBuoy is that it has immediate timeouts because it's a broadcast system. So if you type in the name of a network path and you do a start run of backslash, backslash, or I will say it from here on, whack, whack, scratch, but you misspell scratch, it's going to come back and say, well, there is no server name scratch. Unfortunately, we were not on NetBuoy over in the Windows NT world. We were all on TCP IP where the timeouts can be 90 seconds for a failed DNS query. So we were stuck with these ultra long timeouts and the shell would just lock up and hang waiting for it to come back. That's fine again on a broadcast network, but it doesn't work very well on TCP IP. So my job was to rewrite that whole bit so that it was all done asynchronously and each task that you've launched got tracked on a separate thread that would sit there and wait for the results to come back and report any errors asynchronous of you being able to run other things. So if you typed in whack whack, scratch banana and there was no share name banana on the server scratch or there was no server scratch it wouldn't just sit there and hang it would come back immediately and you could do other things it might take a while up to 90 seconds before it came back and said hey there is no such name server but at least your system was useful in the meantime and that was my little contribution to that whole aspect of things one weird outgrowth of making things asynchronous and hitting the server and doing these kinds of things actually comes from what i think is a raymond chen story to give credit where credit is due but as I understand it, if you type in a share name like whack, whack, scratch, and then you're going to type in the share name of Abacus, 
Well, as soon as you type A, it's going to hit the server to say, hey, are there any shares starting with A? And if not, then it's going to not autocomplete anything. But if you type AB, now it's going to go hit the server and say, is there anything starting with AB? And if there are, it'll try to autocomplete it. And if not, it'll just come back. And that works well enough. The problem is on NT, if you get too many access denies, there's an auditing system that can deny you access to the server for some length of time once you've tried too many times and failed. So if you hit a share name that doesn't exist, you'll get an access denied or a file not found or whatever. But that air condition that comes back, I guess, is counted as some kind of hit on the server. And every failed hit on the server counts against you for your IP or your, I don't know how it tracks it, to be fair, but it counts against you. And pretty soon you've locked yourself out of the server just by virtue of typing a fairly long share name and having it autocomplete for you. So, of course, that was something that was fixed well before ship, but it's something we ran into internally once we had added this functionality to the shell. And if you enjoy these little looks back, please uh, remember to subscribe to the channel because I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you'd consider leaving me one of each today before you go. Ding. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Ding, ding, ding.